Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get started. So this is session 1.5 uh, out of, of three. Uh, we called it 1.5 since it's not uh, applicable to everybody. Uh, we wanted to take a moment to sort of go down a separate road uh, for the lab, clinical, and studio courses. Um, obviously for the fall, it's not gonna be so easy. And in spring, it was not so easy uh, to try to teach these courses fully online. Uh, we still don't know what the fall holds exactly, but uh, for most people, they should sort of prepare to do fully online just so that they know um, sort of the, ex the most extreme option they might have to go to. Uh, but for, for clinicals and labs and studios, we wanted to talk about uh, and spend some time specifically thinking about how to blend those courses and make use of some online and some face-to-face -face, um, depend, you know, and, and how give you, give you all some tools to work with uh, given whatever might come in the fall. All right, so moving on. Uh, so we started the first workshop with a similar list here, but we've added a new one in the middle and I've made the definitions a little different. Um, so the three modes that most of you might have thought about and, and considered uh, or looked forward or looked toward to um, and then and heard about would be web enhanced. We're a class, um, all the credit hours take place in the classroom. Um, and then some technology might be used for homework or posting materials online like my courses or having students submit um, assignments online, but it wouldn't involve uh, any class time not happening in that face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, for flipping, this one's a new one. It wasn't on the slide from Monday. Um, this is where direct instruction takes place outside of the classroom. And then class time is spent working on activities and assignments and more active things. So this idea kind of comes from the K through 12 world where the flip meant the teaching takes place or the, the sort of lecture instruction takes place at home and then the homework takes place in the classroom. So that's where that flip word originally comes from. Um, and then there's blending where some classroom time is shifted online. Uh, so instead of, for example, for a three, cl three credit, three hour a week class or two hours and 40 minutes, um, maybe you know, half of that takes place online or a third of that takes place online uh, through some activities, some stuff that you post and record for them to watch online, review online, for them to work on online, um, where you're still needing the same amount of credit hours, but it's not all happening in the face-to-face -face classroom. So before uh, we, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use both blending and flipping um, in, in your courses, but first we're gonna sort of introduce and talk a little bit about blending, then talk a little bit about flipping and what are the sort of facts of those. Um, so three sort of things we wanna point out with blending is there is no one perfect blend, which can make it kind of tricky because with online um, and face-to-face, -face, there's sort of like tried and true strategies for just general teaching and learning um, that we recommend to a lot of folks to sort of do in similar ways, you know, customized to the discipline. But with blending, you know, everybody could do it completely differently. What you choose to do face-to-face, -face, what you choose to do online would vary greatly based on your discipline. Um, and, you know, there's no, also no sort of, a course should be half online, half face-to-face, 30% face-to-face, 70% online, 80% face-to-face, 20% online. Um, you kind of have to figure out, and we'll talk about ways to, to figure this out, um, what is the right blend for you? Uh, what is the right percentage or ratio face-to-face uh, -face and online time? Uh, we can help you sort of figure that out, but there's no, oh, just like Rachel said, there's no cookie cutter approach to planning out your blended schedule and your blended course. Uh, another sort of myth, I, I guess, would be called is blending doesn't create days off. Um, so if you have some people and sort of the, the original sort of blending models were like, you know, in a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, for example, um, they would just meet Monday, Wednesday, and then they would have Friday off and there would be a discussion online or something. And it kind of gave students the idea that Friday was off, but it's not a day off. It's sort of online time that would have, that's sort of replacing your face-to-face -face time. Um, so it's, we, we recommend when, if you do a blended course, you never say it's the day off, it's just blended time uh, because it sort of sets the tone for what students are expecting there. Um, and then sort of related to what's happening right now, it lends, the blended model lends itself um, to reduce classroom capacity. Uh, so within the fall, and I think it's pretty likely to say you won't be able to have a lecture hall full of 100 students, um, being able to blend and reconsider when students come to class and how many come to class and when different groups of students come to class, um, blending and thinking about your course in that way 
uh, gives you some flexibility in ways to sort of lessen who's in the room at, at once. So now let's talk about a few examples of blended learning. And these are sort of general examples for three different types of courses. Um, and, and it's sort of uh, just some ideas to sort of think about and potentially sort of note down as something that could be adapted to work for you. Uh, but by no means is this a complete list of your only three options. It's just three examples. Uh, so in this example here, a three credit course that meets three times a week for 50 minutes, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, so the sort of short, quick, um, uh, synopsis of how this person might blend uh, is instead of meeting on the Friday, the third day of the week, the students go online, watch a short recorded lecture, um, and then they complete an activity, like a discussion or a writing activity or working on a project. Um, they could be preparing something for the following week, working on a reflective journal or something like that. Um, and the way that the weeks are structured is that it's not necessarily Friday that students are gonna to have to do something. Um, it's just after class on Wednesday, blended mode starts, um, and then whatever they had to do online, um, what do we do before the following Monday uh, class? So you really look at the Friday is now from end of class Wednesday until the start of class on Monday. That's just a, blend, a block of online time where they have to sort of accomplish what they would have accomplished on the Friday, uh, but it's not like they need to get online Friday from 9 to 9.50. Um, so you're sort of managing this sort of mini online lesson during that, that course of time. Example two, uh, so this is a lab course that meets Monday, Wednesday for 90 minutes each, each block. Um, so instead of meeting on Monday, the students will watch a recorded demonstration and simulation that's been prepared by the instructor of a lab exercise online, uh, and then also a short lecture video with some other information from the instructor, uh, or maybe a Zoom session where the instructor tells them about it live. Um, and then they'll also work on assigned readings and prep work uh, for what they're gonna do on Wednesday. So that instead of meeting two days a week, Monday, Wednesday, they're only gonna meet on the Wednesday and sort of the instructors shifting um, some of the prep work, demonstration, um, and things students can sort of consume versus things they have to actively do into the online environment. Uh, so that would mean new online work gets released every week after class on Wednesday. Um, and then it's due, whatever that might be, uh, by the following Wednesday. So again, it's not that this is stuff, something that's gonna happen on Monday when class would have otherwise happened. It's just stuff happening in the off time. All right, so example three, uh, studio courses that meet Tuesday and Thursday for four hours each. Uh, so this approach uh, would have the class split in half. Uh, so half would come on Tuesday and half would come on Thursday. And students would, on the day, uh, during the time that they're you know, in between classes, since they're only going once a week to the physical classroom, um, they would watch online demonstration videos that have been prepared by the instructor and found online by the instructor. They would read what they need to read, um, review examples, uh, and do prep work so that when they come into the class on the day that their uh, half of the course is scheduled to meet, um, they're ready to go and jump into whatever hands-on or, or uh, exercises that are, that are scheduled for that day. And then every week, the instructor would release new content on Thursday um, after the, the second group has met, uh, and the students would have to all get it done by Monday uh, so that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday time is really dedicated to um, them meeting, and then everybody kind of gets that Wednesday off, and then whatever half gets the opposite day off that they don't have to go to class. All right, so here's where we sort of made up our own word. <laughs> uh, so we found that pitching and sort of designing blended courses, these two strategies kind of go hand in hand, the idea of blending and flipping, and we call it blipping. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it's not an official term, it's just sort of the way we recommend people blend is to do sort of both of these at once. Uh, so let's look at how we define blending um, and how those two can sort of be married together. So we're gonna watch a quick video here. Every course that has some face-to-face -face component progresses through a sequence of in-class time and out-of-class time. In a traditional lecture-based class, students are typically assigned a sequence of in- Sorry, sorry, it, it, it blipped for a minute. I'm gonna restart it one more time. Uh, if you can't hear it, let me know, but I think you can, but it, it just froze on me. 
Every course that has some face-to-face -face component progresses through a sequence of in-class time and out-of-class time. In a traditional lecture-based class, students are typically assigned material to study before coming to class, but then are expected to sit through a presentation that often covers similar content, and then assign something to do for homework usually on their own. In a flipped class, students have access to the instructor's lectures ahead of time, along with any other background material that they need, which frees up face-to-face -face time to let students seek clarification from instructors, collaborate with peers, and practice applying concepts while getting guidance and feedback directly from experts in the moment when it can help the most. This lets students leave class with an even greater collection of resources and a clearer awareness of what they need to focus on to close any gaps that remain in their learning. All right, so that's the video. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. There. Nope, not again. Next, okay. <laughs> Uh, so now let's talk a little bit about the process of approaching flipped and uh, designing your course to be delivered in a flip mode. Um, so the first step is to reflect on your course and sort of think about what you have. And we talked a little bit about that last, uh, last session on Monday um, to sort of understand the pieces you're working with and the outcomes that you need to meet and the objectives you need to meet um, and, and, and sort of pre-plan what you need to work toward. Um, then you're going to identify the active and the passive components of your course. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how you define and identify those uh, coming up. Uh, and then we have a flipped course plan worksheet that we recommend to a lot of folks um, that can be used to sort of take uh, the things you've identified as active and passive, what you want students to do, what you're going to do, and sort of schedule out one week um, so that you have a plan for what your course is going to look like during that week and when things are going to happen. Uh, and then last, you sort of, we recommend looking into the technology options um, that are available to you to help make that happen, especially the online stuff. How might you put your lecture online? How might you deliver some piece of content or conduct some activity? Think about the tech sort of last um, that you'll need to execute your plan and your vision. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, Dale's cone of experience, and this is a good way to start thinking about which pieces of your course are passive and which pieces of your course are active. Um, it's not, this, one is not better than the other, um, even though this, you know, the, the one sort of piece is bigger looking than the other here. Um, but there's sort of that age old saying of like students remember 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, 70% of what they say and write, and 90% of what they do. I think there's a Benjamin Franklin quote that summarizes that a little bit more eloquently. Something about show me, teach me, something about a fish. Um, <laughs> so what types of things might be considered passive learning? Okay, um, so that would be your readings, listening to something, watching something, viewing images, watching a demonstration, attending an exhibition or, or a lab, or uh, not a lab, lecture, um, those would typically be considered passive. Um, and the types of out, uh, outcomes or objectives that would be used to describe students um, participating in those activities would be the defines, explains, describes, demonstrates, applies, uh, those sort of that particular um, sort of lower levels, not lower levels, the earlier levels of, of Bloom's uh, there. Uh, and then the active learning activities would be your hands-on workshops where they're doing things, um, things where they're performing a simulation or an exercise or an experiment, building a model, pr presenting something, um, an oral presentation, creating you know, an actual, you know, in, in a studio or something like that, creating some sort of product or, or, or deliverable. Um, those are the more active um, exercises where um, your verbs would be analyzing, defining, creating, evaluating, constructing, building. Um, think of the more concrete sort of creation um, verbs, those that end of, of there. Okay, uh, so now we are going to do some polling. Uh, so we're going to throw out a few different um, sample activities and then we want each of you to vote uh, on whether you think that they are passive activities or active activities. Um, so in a moment I'm going to start a poll. We've got about eight polls to go through but they'll be pretty quick um, and we want you to vote and then we are interested to see um, what everybody votes and we'll share the results to sort of see um, what everybody said. So first one's coming at you right now. It should pop up on your screen. And the first one here is lab demonstrations. Uh, so take your take your votes or take your make make your votes now. 
Okay, I've got four of nine. Okay, interesting, okay, okay. How many people have we got in here? We've got 11 people minus me, so I want full participation here. Eight of nine, I'll give them a second. All right, everybody has voted, okay. End the polling, and then I'm going to share the results. So you should now be seeing how everybody voted. Um, so 33% of three out of nine voted active, and then 67%, um, six out of nine voted passive. Um, so this one was, is interesting because um, this, I usually, we usually start with the one that's a little more one-sided and what we think people will vote, um, sort of all pa active or all passive. Um, but for this one, especially given, you know, it's about blending and, and at more active courses, um, I wanted to start with this instead. Um, does anybody want to share why they think that? I'm gonna turn on microphones um, or the ability to share microphones for a moment. Um, if you'd like to talk, use along the bottom of the screen. Um, there should be a, a ability to react and raise your hand. And we'd love to hear from you. And then let us know why you voted, why you did. Nobody wants to share. <laughs> And that's okay if you don't want to. Oh, okay, we've got Nancy one Nancy does. Oh, Nancy. Andrew, there's no, there's no raise your hand under reactions. It's, it's under um, participants, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, no. It's just me. I'm just, I just do tech support with Zoom. I don't know where the buttons are. Click on participants and raise hand is going to be in the lower right corner. Uh, but Nancy, what did, what, why'd you vote what you voted? Uh, because the students are just watching. They're not doing anything. Okay. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, Rob's also got his hand up. What do you think, Rob? What did you vote? I, I voted the same way. Um, the students are watching a demonstration of something that they are subsequently going to do themselves uh, and you know, watching somebody do something and then actually trying to do it yourself is a pretty big difference as anybody who's ever used a YouTube video to fix their lawnmower or something like that knows. Sure, sure. So I just want to chime in for a second, Andrew. Um, it's Rachel. Hi, everybody. Um, so the reason why, another reason why we're kind of crafting this poll is to kind of have this dialogue about, um, you know, an opportunity to reflect on, is a lab demonstration a passive learning opportunity? If yes, if that is something the students aren't engaging with and hands-on and um, on their own, then is it something that can be moved to the online environment? That way they make use of the time at home, they make use of the online mode of instruction, and then when they actually do have to come to a face-to-face -face session, they are better prepared and they're ready to just get down to work to maximize that face-to-face -face time. So I think that's something that we all need to kind of keep in mind in front and center as we kind of go through these polling options. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about, about more about what to do with these things once you identify them as passive or active. But we're going to move on to the next one now. And this one is reflections and journals. So cast your votes. Oh, this one's a bit more one-sided. I've got seven of nine. I'm waiting for two more here. Eight and one more. No pressure, no pressure. All right, so I'm going to end this one, and then I'll share the results. And so this one was overwhelmingly voted to be active. Um, so does anybody want to share why they think this is an active um, activity? Raise them hands under participants in the lower right-hand corner. You'll see a uh, raise hand button. All right, Sadie. Yeah, um, simply because they're writing their okay. reflections and what is coming directly from the student. Uh -huh. So it seems a little clearer. Uh -huh. um, I did want to say in a studio setting regarding the, uh, the previous question, 
being able to see someone demonstrate something, even though at the moment students are in a more passive mode, they can always stop you and ask, how did you do that? And that would change if it was completely online. Wow. So in the studio setting, we tend to do demos, even though you don't get a lot of questions. Sometimes it almost looks like students might even be looking away, but then they can come back to it in the moment or later so anyway that was one distinction i wanted to point out well, no it's a good observation a lot of people um when we do these polls share a similar thing about students watching a demonstration of something uh depending on their discipline and how they teach um some might consider that to be more of an active activity the the, the, the demonstrations but um it, it's usually pretty unanimous about unanimous about students writing they're actively reflecting yeah. on an experience a learning or something so um Yes, that's that's a pretty unanimous one. All right, next up, pull it off my screen, and then we're gonna do lectures. Launch the poll. Cast your votes. Oh, this one's quick. <laughs> All right, just waiting for a couple more. All right, so this one very much flip flop to the other side. All right, so I'm gonna end the polling here, share our results, and surprise, passive. <laughs> uh, so again, anybody wanna raise their hand and, uh, and share why they voted? Okay, Nancy, you're up first, what's up? What do you think? Oh yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what do you think? Okay, no, I was um, thinking about what Ziddy said. Um, and I thought, well, you know, actually he has a point because if you ask the students to visualize themselves, imagine themselves doing something, then I suppose uh, a demonstration could be somewhat active if they are, you know, seriously imagining themselves doing it in preparation for having to do it themselves. Sure. Uh, and uh, regarding the, the lectures, yes, I agree they're quite passive, but I am one of probably like one person in the university, <laughs> uh, at least in my discipline, who does not use PowerPoint lectures. Um, I write on piece, a piece of paper. I have handouts. I basically want the students to write. I want them actively taking notes. I want them writing on handouts and diagrams and things. So oh. in some way, lectures could be a little bit more active, but the traditional PowerPoint lectures, I think, are pretty passive. Sure. My sure. opinion. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right, Jay, I just saw your hand pop up. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, pick up on what Nancy said. I think the word lecture connotes passive learning all the way because we think of it in a certain model, which is sort of the, the stage on sta stage on stage or chalk and talk uh, kind of framework. It doesn't have to be that. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've realized in my own teaching that there are very good pedagogical reasons for using a lecture forward format to introduce material or to set context or to define terms. But as Nancy suggested, there are ways to incorporate active learning strategies into the lecturing, that it doesn't have to be 50 minutes of a monologue. It could be short, you know, seven minute bursts followed by, you know, think pair share activities or writing exercises. There are ways to break it up, um, you know, to sort of make it more of a combination of, of passive and, and active. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and it is. It's very indicative of how someone teaches, what the subject matter is, and what you're able to do. Um, and and I'm going to throw out another one after this that I'm hoping it gets a little more of a divide, uh, so that we can sort of get some back and forth about why people are on different sides of the fence here. Uh, so let's try the next one. All right, let's end that one. And let's pick. Hmm. Quizzes and exams. All right, the next one should have popped up just now. Quizzes and exams. OK, 
Okay, maybe a little less divisive than I thought. Still waiting on one more vote. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to end the polling and then I'll share results back to you. So we got 88% uh, active and 1% one, uh, one uh, thirteen percent one person passive. So I hate to single somebody out, but I really want to hear both sides of this. So would the one person who voted passive be willing to share what they think and why they voted passive? That would be me. Okay. Um, and I wasn't totally sure about my response, uh, but I went with my initial instinct. And I think the reason for that instinct is that when I use these kinds of uh, uh, assessments in my own classes, which I do, I don't really think of them as forcing the students to actively engage with the material in a, in a, in a creative way. So that the, you know, basically they're just, you're, they're regurgitating. And some regurgitation is really important because it forces them to like do the reading and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a, 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 in a large international relations class where I have to do multiple choice, they're basically just regurgitating what they've memorized. In a smaller one where I can have them do a take home essay, you know, they're forced to be creative uh, and they've complained about it. So that's mm -hmm. sort of the difference that I have in mind. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And that's usually the passive side of the, uh, of the vote, usually sort of thinks about it and, expl and, and explains it that way. Uh, so does an active voter want to share their, their, their take on it? I know there's, there's seven of you out there. Jay? Sure. I mean, I, I, I think depending on how the quiz or exam is set up, it's an opportunity for the student to engage actively with the material. Both, yes, there's some, there's some recall and a demonstration of what the student has retained, but there's also an opportunity for synthesis and application. I mean, at least that's what I think the most useful exams and quizzes are, sort of asking students to take what they've learned and then apply it to something related that they haven't seen before. So I think even though, again, quiz and exam connotes passivity, there are opportunities in the design of the quiz or exam um, to make it more of an active learning experience. And I would just follow that by saying there are also opportunities or, or ways to think about low stakes quizzing in class. I mean, for example, even using group quizzing with no grades at stake, but sort of creating an opportunity to sort of take the pulse of what students are retaining and, and how the learning has become durable over time. So again, depending the way that it's designed, it can be more active than passive. I also want to chime in here too. I think something that's important to consider is, especially for the labs, the clinical and the studio folks, a lot of your quizzes might be a hands-on, on-the-spot creation of some sorts, right? So don't mind my toddler shaking something full of beans in the background. If you can hear that, I apologize. Um, I rarely unmute for this very reason. Um, but I think that needs to be considered. We're going to talk in a little bit about plotting out um, the, co the components of your course and kind of developing a map or a schedule per unit per week and then eventually for your semester. Um, but these are things to consider. So it's not a hard, fast rule of, um, you know, if it's passive, it has to go online. If it's active, it has to be in class. You have to think about what you're really trying to get out of the student. Um, so, you know, kind of to chime back on what Rob was saying, um, if they're just regurgitating knowledge, then yes, I think quizzing can be more of a passive um, experience for them. They're, it's more of like a, an inventory or getting you know, a checklist of do they know it, do they, you know, do they not know it, um, where creating something on the spot is something definitely active. They have to produce something, and it also creates that need for the guide on the side that Andrew had mentioned earlier, where the instructor is present during their quiz, during their face-to-face -face assessment, where they can kind of redirect any misconceptions or, or kind of um, skills that need adjusting. 
Yeah, exam takes a different form in a lot of different courses. And that's why we lump quizzes and exams together into this, because quizzes have a particular connotation of, you know, checking that they made sure they watched a reading or did stuff online. But exam could be so many things. Uh, it could be, you know, like Rachel said, watching a demonstration of them doing something. So, uh, Nancy, I just saw your hand came up. Um, yes, I just, I had a question thinking about my uh, courses for the fall. So I have a lab course where it's a lot of being ident able to identify specimens or slides. <clears throat> so there is a fair amount of uh, memorization, but the students learn structures of the organism and stuff like that. Mm. And I was just wondering, is there a way I could use my courses? So if I had a document camera or I could share my screen, I could hold the specimen or show a slide and have them respond kind of in real time um, as if they were taking a practical where you know they're going to be walking around stations in a laboratory uh, room which mm -hmm. obviously they they can't do yeah. so i was just wondering if i could still have that part of my course and actually do it remotely sure yeah there's there's a lot of tools out there where you can um or I guess not a lot of tools, but there is tools out there, or there are tools out there that you can use that are sort of, um, the one that comes to mind is, is Kaltura, where um, you as the instructor can sort of record, for example, showing a few different samples or talking through a few different samples and then having it automatically stop at certain points um, and asking students to provide an answer. Um, typically, they're multiple choice answers. So you could say, you know, what did I just show you? And then they have to pick what the right answer is. Um, and it's, it's not an oral thing, it's more of a written or a multiple choice. Um, but there, there's, there's ways to do it. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about tech options in future sessions. This one's really to get everybody thinking about identifying some things they'd like to try to move online and figure out what might go online and what might not. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good idea, a good, um, good line of good thinking uh, to think about something like that to potentially go online. Another option to consider, Nancy, um, or a fallback if that, if we can't figure out the right technology to use to kind of recreate that exact live stationed experience, um, we could think about using hotspots, um, the question type that's in my course's quizzing. Um, you could post slides and have students identify the key features that they need to or come up with something where it's more slideshow based and they could, um, you know, provide their answer in some other way that necess it, it isn't necessarily live, but we could definitely work with something. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. So I, I assume we'll be able to contact you folks once we work out what we think we want to do. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, you're not restricted to us just in the workshop today and, and these, this series. We're around, uh, we're planning to be around all summer. Um, so we're always here to, to help, help connect you to some options. Okay, thank you. All righty, so let's do one more. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's interesting, I use these polls and we usually do this particular activity with um, just a general audience of people who teach labs, teach, teach lectures, and so they tend to lean one way, but with a class, uh, with a group full, that is full of uh, people who teach studios, labs, and um, and, and clinicals, they are all leaning one particular way because you all do things very similarly. Uh, but let's try this one. Q&A sessions. Cash to votes. Looking for two more, let's see. Okay, you're gonna close it in three, two, one, and end. All right, that one went overwhelmingly active. Not too surprising there, uh, since it's pretty much, oh, I'm sorry, a passive came in at the last moment. <laughs> um, um, so uh, who would like to share what they, what they voted? And of course, I'd love to hear from the one person who voted pass as well, but uh, raise your hand and then we'll, we'll, we'll pick out who can talk.
Anybody? Bueller? Okay, uh, ZD? Um, I, <laughs> I voted active, but I know in class when I ask questions, if someone answers the question or if I answer a question that the first person asks, a few other hands will go down because I, I've already answered their question. So it can be passive for some people in the room. So it just it depends. I, I'm not really contradicting what I voted, but it's nuanced. If I'm in front of the class asking the questions, it's different than if it's uh, something they have to fill in and where they actively have to answer all the questions. That's all. Sure. And it might even depend on your role. Are you the person asking the question or the person just sort of watching the Q&A happen? Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Sure. All right, Rob. Yeah, I my I was also torn on this one. It really depended on how I thought about it. Um, my experience with question and answering, whether I'm the questioner or the answerer, is that the students who are actively participating are engaged in active learning. Mm -hmm. But in a large class, the majority will be passive, uh, perhaps not even paying attention to it, annoyed that you know, students are talking too much and things like that. So it really depends on the context. Sure, yeah. And that's, and, and for a lot of these uh, options that we put out there, it can depend. It can depend on the student, it can depend on the activity, the prompt, um, and it's, it, it just gets sort of more nuanced the more you look into every single activity in your course and how you run it, whether um, it's passive or passive. There's sort of the two layer decision of like passive or active, and then on campus or on in classroom or online. Uh, and that decision could get tougher and tougher the more um, specific your activities are and the more you look through your particular course. All right, so if nobody else wants to comment, then we'll move on from this. All right. Oh, I never shared the results. I'm sorry. It was uh, it was it was interesting. So one vote came in after the fact, like right as I stopped. So it was um, eight people uh, voted active and then one passive. Okay, moving on here. So now those examples we looked at earlier. Um, this is what's called our flipped course plan sort of worksheet. Um, so this is how we recommend people um, put down their sort of categorization of active and passive components into a weekly schedule. Uh, so this is again that blended flip um, uh, for those, those examples I showed earlier, which just had a sort of happened to be also be uh, flipped blends, um, but I just didn't tell you about it yet. <laughs> um, so uh, in this course, this was the one where they met three days a week or they were scheduled to meet uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 50 minutes each session, uh, but they were blended and the Monday, Wednesday were the meetings. And then after class on Wednesday, they had online stuff to do um, that would be due before class on the following week on Monday. Um, so this is a good way to think about how you organize your class where, um, you know, you figure out what days are going to be the passive ones, the, the, the days where active or passive stuff's happening. Uh, but again, that can be nuanced because they can certainly do active stuff outside of the classroom. Uh, but for the most part, um, you look at sort of the week starts on Monday, right, when the first class happens. Um, and in the classroom, they're going to do group work, activities, exams. Q and A's, whatever sort of active things and activities, and you become um, the person who introduces those activities. You're the guide on the side, sort of floating around the room, answering questions. Um, the Tuesday in between Monday and Wednesday is a breather day. Nothing's due, nothing's new. Everybody comes in on Wednesday, and you sort of continue that same um, same rhythm. You do whatever activities you wanted to do, potentially some exams, uh, maybe since that's the last day of the face-to-face -face week, um, Q and A's. And again, you're sort of floating around the room, guide on the side. Uh, and then after that class on Wednesday, the, the, the students from Thursday until before class on Monday start looking at the online work. You release that work for them uh, and you start grading as they go throughout those days um, and start submitting uh, whatever deliverables that you asked for them to do. Um, and then Sunday that, or that Sunday before the class on Monday, everything is due, you grade and prep for class on Monday, and then the, the cycle uh, repeats. Um, the first week, it's a little um, you know, more introductory and welcoming the students, but once you get into the rhythm and you've sort of got one week down, you start building your Mondays um, so that they hit the ground running and that you use that online time from, in this example, um, after class on Wednesday, really Thursday, 
uh, through Sunday night um, to make sure that they're prepped and ready to go for Monday to be active in the classroom, that they have the quote unquote lecture material, they have the, the background, they've done their readings and things like that. Um, and the things that you're going to have them do in class, um, they won't be able to be successful unless they've done that. So that the online is supporting the face-to-face. -face. Um, and it's one sort of, it's not sort of, here's the online portion of the class, here's the face-to-face -face portion of the class. Um, you can't succeed in one or the other um, without sort of doing the whole and taking both seriously. And that's again, avoiding that view of it being the day off. Um, so this is sort of one example of that. So here was example two. This was a lab that met twice a week, Monday, Wednesday, um, for 90 minutes each time. Um, so this was the blended flipped version, the blipped version of that, um, where they met on Wednesdays. Um, so that was the quote unquote active day um, where you did the experiments, exercises, lab work, exams, uh, questions and answer sessions of always. And again, similar role for the instructor. You introduce things, you float around the room being guided on the side and answering questions. Um, and then Thursday through Sunday, or Monday potentially, um, you release the online work and they, they work on everything in between the two classes. And again, that could be, you know, watching pre-recorded demonstrations, listening to you lecture, um, other online resources that you might assign to them, readings, anything like that. Um, I added in this column for Monday because I'd mentioned um, potentially having a Zoom be Monday instead of recording a lecture. Um, so if you, in this example, if that instructor chose to do Zoom instead of um, recording something that would be the day for that to happen uh, but really for the most part if they didn't do zoom Tuesday would be the day that everything's due and everything that they had to do would prepare them to walk into class on Wednesday ready to rock and roll uh, um, and, and jump right in and, and start working on experiments and, and the active components um, that could only be done in the classroom Next up, uh, so here was example three. This was the studio course that was scheduled to meet uh, twice a week, Tuesday, Thursday for four hours. Um, so this one was a little different than um, just everybody being, so, you know, working online for, for a day replacement. Uh, this was where Tuesday half the class came and Thursday half the class came um, and sort of the half that were in the classroom would do whatever, you know, the Tuesday, Thursday would be nearer. So essentially half the class would be there one, Tuesday half the class would be Thursday. Um, we crafted this example specifically because of, um, you know, the, the classroom restrictions as an example for how, if you don't, uh, aren't able to have a lot of students in the room. Uh, so on the active day for whatever group you're in, you're doing your studio work, you still have your longer four hour, however long it might be block of time together. You do that work, exams, answer questions as the instructor along the way. And then again, the instructor's role is pretty consistent, introducing things, potentially doing um, you know, corrections and guiding on side and answering questions. Um, and then in the off time from Friday to Sunday, uh, or Friday to Monday rather, you release new work, students do that work. Um, you grade and prep for Tuesday's class to happen. Um, but then Wednesday is their breather day and Tuesday, Thursday, or, or I guess Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is dedicated just to class stuff. Um, so if you only come Tuesday, then you're off Wednesday, Thursday. If you only come Thursday, then you're off days or Tuesday, Wednesday, because all the online work uh, was due on Monday. Um, so it gives them at least a little bit breather in the middle. Uh, I just saw a hand go up. Rob, uh, what, what you thinking? What's up? Well, my reading of, of what's generally happening across the country in the preparation for the fall is that a lot of classes are going to be forced into this mode because there simply aren't enough uh, large classrooms to accommodate social distancing. So mm -hmm. my, I'm curious as to what your sense of that at UMass Dartmouth is. I mean, I mean, just be up front, be, you know, be, on, be up front with this. Is this what we should all be planning to do? So we designed, we were sort of designing this whole series to be designing everyone to do as much online as possible. For folks who don't teach clinical studios and labs, we're recommending planning to learn how to teach fully online and, and working toward that. Um, and then for the clinical studios and labs, try to figure out how to even put as much as possible online. Again, that's not based on anything from the university. We know no more than you, but uh, if you plan for sort of the most remote possible and then you're given a little more, it's easy to sort of take back some time and fill in some face-to-face -face time you didn't expect that you'd have than it is to go in the other direction as you learn for spring. Being reactively going online is rarely a, good, a, a great experience for you or for the students. So if you can plan ahead to be pretty much remote as much as possible, 
that's, I think, the best. I don't think the school knows exactly how they're going to do these uh, this blended options for labs, studios, and clinicals, but I think they know that there's good, they're gonna, we're going to have to figure out something for them um, so that there can be some on-ground activity for those types of courses. But what those will look like, we don't know exactly. So if you can sort of plan and get to know some tools that, and strategies that can help you plan for that, um, we're hope, just sort of hoping to make people as prepared as possible for something that's still pretty uncertain. But I say plan for the worst and then work your way backwards if you have uh, more flexibility and, and if it comes along. I want to chime in too. Um, I did put a disclaimer, even though Andrew verbally said it, I put a text one. We really do not have any insider information on this. Um, we're kind of rolling along just like everyone else is. Um, but Andrew and I have, you know, spent a lot of time talking about what's the, the probably the most efficient way to handle this for folks. Um, and just based on what we know and considering that we kind of get a little insight into everybody's different um, types of courses, their different needs, we, we work with all faculty on campus. Um, so it runs the gamut of kind of what we see and what we hear um, and experience from, from what their needs are. I just think just like Andrew was saying, it's a lot better to be proactive. And then if in the event they decide, you know, um, we have ample space, we can open up the schedule a little bit more. It's a lot easier to view that now newly added time back into our schedule in a face-to-face -face environment as a bonus time, rather than um, be, you know, down to the wire and thinking, oh my gosh, now they've taken away all my face-to-face -face time. Now what do I do with all the stuff I had already spent summer planning to be face-to-face -face with? Um, it's just, it's probably better to try to put as much online as possible and kind of plan for a flipped as best as you can, given that, you know, your course, your subject matter and the goals that you need to accomplish with your students. Um, and then, and we can always work with you to see, all right, this is a great plan, but how about considering tweaking this assignment to move it online or yes, we can make, you know, ample use, I'm sorry, not ample use, make uh, better use of the face-to-face -face time that now we do have. Um, to pull this assignment back out of the online online environment. So, does that answer your question, Rob? Yes, that's that's very helpful. Um, one of the push one of the sources of pushback that I've seen talking with people about this, uh, and that you should you've probably encountered, uh, is that people view this as two preps. You know that if I if I've got to if I've got to teach teach the same thing to two different groups of people simultaneously, it's like two preps. Personally, I don't view it that way. I think you just have to think about it differently. But, you know, I'm a little alarmed that there are only 11 of us here when, like, most small classes might well start in this mode in the, in, in the fall, regardless of the nature of the class. Yeah. I've heard that about the two preps as well. And, um, you know, I would, my counter to that is, People have already been doing this. You know, a lot of schools do this, and have been doing this for years, blending and uh, especially in their in their labs and, and sciences and studios and clinicals. They've been blending for a long time, and it takes different forms. And the coronavirus situation certainly puts a lot of people under the gun to be as much in line, as online as possible, and perhaps more than they feel comfortable. Um, but they're not. If they were doubling your roster, then I would say that's two preps. But it's still the same, or presumably it will be the same amount of students in the class. So you're still handling the same core group. And um, blending's been around for years and years and years and years. Um, so even though it seems like it's you know more work, it's really just as much to plan out an online activity as it is to plan out a face-to-face -face activity. You know, you got to figure out how. You know, what are you going to do with them, <laughs> so to speak? Um, and so online sort of presents this. Uh, viewed as added work, especially in your development phase where you have to figure out the tools and you have to figure out how you're going to do things, but it is also very reusable. So if you want to teach this next semester in a blended format, you pretty much have a structure ready to go that you can tweak and that's not too different from face to face. The first time you teach something, it's always harder. You have to figure out what you want to cover, when you want to cover it, how do you want to deliver something to the students. Um, and blended is the same way. Some folks, it's been a while since they've had to rethink how they do things and, and that's, that's okay. You know, some people just have sort of figure out what works and, and stick with it. Um, but it's really no different than teaching a new course, which is, is uncomfortable, especially in the spring when it's like, okay, in two weeks you're teaching fully online for the first time and you've never, you know, saved a Word document. It's like, oh my God, that's horrifying. <laughs> um, but hopefully over the course of the summer, people can have a little more time to think um, and that, you know, can, can change how successful people can be.
All right, so moving on. So here's uh, sort of part of the last thing to think about now uh, before you sort of make a concrete plan of, of how you could do a blended course or uh, given what you've got um, is you're sort of working with these four uh, unknowns. Um, so first is what is the university going to allow? What are the restrictions or limitations you're working within in terms of how many students can you have in the class? What, um, you know, what class spaces are they offering? Uh, these are things you're gonna have to think about sort of on top of a normal situation, blending and flipping. Um, so there's what's the university able to offer and, and do? What is your college offering and, and sort of making available? Um, and then same thing for your department. What are the recommendations from your department on how to handle things? Is there a you know, sort of unified approach that folks are trying to work towards so that students in a particular department have a similar experience, especially in these uh, studios and clinicals and labs? And then you and the students, what are your students working with and what are you working with in terms of what do you already know how to do? What have you already produced? Um, and what can you learn how to produce to make this work? All right, so this is, uh, we have reached the end here. And so there's some homework. Uh, so first, I'll mention, um, we have some worksheets up on the website that we're gonna send out later with this recording, um, is to inventory your own active and passive components, uh, sort of as we did. So look, take a look at your own course schedule um, as it is now. And, you know, just for the first, you know, pick maybe like week three or something. Um, and take inventory of active and passive components. And then use that table we were looking at a moment ago uh, to sort of design what you think your course plan could look like. Um, where might the passive components fit potentially out of the classroom and what active components must absolutely happen face to face and try to figure out what a balance could be for you, what you are able to offload to online realistically um, and sort of design that for course plan uh, one unit at a time. And then also, and this is going to be sort of a longer term uh, piece of homework, we, you know, you can't figure this out right now, but what are those things you're working with that um, we were talking about a moment ago? What are the college, um, college, university, departmental um, realities that you, can, that you can work with and that you sort of have to work around? All right, so that, um, that wraps up what we want to cover. Um, does anybody have any other questions? There's some good chat. There's some good um, back and forth going on in the, in the chat as well. All right. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we I'd can. Just like to um, throw this out at this point in our our blipping presentation. We've done this. We've made many iterations of this, and Andrew's already starting to kind of wear a smile here because it's gone around the world um, and back again. And we've changed it to kind of keep up with the times. Um, but I always like to ask at this point, um, just off the top of your head, without digging too deep, what's your biggest concern, or um, or what are you feeling most overwhelmed by as far as pandemic aside? Um, as far as flipping and blending the schedule. Jay? I would just say, um, based on what I've been hearing both from faculty and students, not just in the transition period, but for the last, you know, several semesters, um, I think consistency in scheduling and organization could be a challenge for instructors and students. That is, because there are so many different disciplinary requirements, um, the blipped or the blended model might look different in one kind of course and necessitate a different kind of schedule or routine than another. So my point is simply that as we're thinking about course design, we also need to think about ways to make it very clear to our students why we're laying out the course the way that we are so that they understand that it's perfectly okay and indeed necessary that one blipped course might look and indeed will look different from another because i do think a lot of students have that monday friday monday wednesday in class friday out of class mentality with the blended model so it's just more of a general comment and a reminder to think of ways and, and to sort of err on, err, err on the side of repetition um, to inform our students and to get them involved in thinking about why we're scheduling things and laying things out the way that we are. Absolutely, being transparent and just letting them know, 
you know, why, not just what they have to do. And there was a question or a comment in the chat about um, trying to maintain that sense of community and connection um, in, in a environment where you're not spending as much time face to face as possible. We will talk about that in some upcoming sessions, um, some strategies for specifically through online, um, engaging the students and keeping them connected um, and, and, you know, having some of that community, uh, even if it is taking somewhat place on, on online. I was going to address um, Mark's comment too. I was just typing it, but I figured I'd stop and just chime in since my children are quiet. Um, so I, I do recognize that with a reduction in seat time because of shared lab spaces and whatnot, um, that there is a concern that there might feel more of a disconnect. But I think if we work towards a more true flipped model, then I think we'll be able to leverage some things to kind of humanize the online portions a little bit more than what they normally are. I think. Um, without a true flip, I think sometimes uh, the online portions can become more resource worthy, right? So we, we put up the, the lecture materials, we put up the templates or the worksheets, and then they just submit assignments um, online when they can before the face-to-face -face portion. But we can work with you um, and help you figure out, you know, is there a way to add in a lecture or provide a different kind of feedback in maybe a different medium than text? Um, and kind of, and, and like I said, humanize the online portions of that course. And I think it might help balance out the concern that you're having. Yep. All right, so we are, we are at time. Um, so if you have any qu last questions, feel free to share them. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Like we said, this will get posted, um, this will get emailed and the recording will be posted and some follow-up stuff will be sent along to you later this afternoon. Uh, and thank you so much for coming.